now available from Amazon, Kindle, and Nook, The Steam Man of the West by Joseph Lovecci. For more information, go to www.steamman.net. Copyright 2013 by Joseph Lovecci. The Steam Man of the West by Joseph Lovecci, Chapter 1. The bright Kansas day cried, too many sons and brothers never more would see its blue abyss. The irony was lost on Frank Rude Jr., who had no interest in the sky unless he could exploit it. He currently only wanted to short circuit the sudden need to relieve himself. As that prospect was unlikely, he dragged his body from his workshop across the field under that magnificent canopy, cursing. It was his own fault. Frank was always drinking water. The result of his hydration had some wags calling him Panda Man after a notoriously small bladdered mammal. On top of everything else, Frank had a song stuck in his head and the battle hymn of the Republic demanded attention. Eventually, he reached his destination, unbuttoned his trousers and set about his disgusting business. For some minutes, he pondered static hydraulic ball manipulation in the absence of viscosity, until his muse, impatience, nagged again. I can't believe I'm still standing here. Why is this taking so long? And what is that smell? Oh, right, asparagus. My eyes have seen the glory. Darn it. When he finally emerged and set back to his workshop, as fumes both physical and mental dissipated, he heard his name. His mother's voice reached out to him and resistance was futile. The sound was so clear, sharp, and loud, he imagined the oxygen and nitrogen atoms amplified the waves just to annoy him. Frank! Frank Rude! Come here this instant! The voice, property of Helen Danner Rude, impressed the listener that this person was terrifying. The sight of her had a similar effect, much to Frank's chagrin, as no one ever showed him even the slightest amount of fear. Frank was a physically average, healthy 24-year-old male, but was average in size only for his species, not his surroundings. Here, his mother, like everyone else, was bigger and stronger than him. He literally looked upwards at her his whole life, and she was not shy about physically intimidating him. Years later in his journal, Frank wrote, Mother's a bitch. How I miss her. No, 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 Frank thought, redirecting himself to the back door of the rude house. My eyes have seen, ah, coming, mother. Upon arrival, she greeted him with hands on hips and impatience. What are you doing, Frank? You know your cousin Charlie Bull just arrived from Wisconsin? You disappeared again, and you know I need you to look after him until supper's ready. You know how he is. He's liable to break every piece of china in the room. Gracious, it's only 30 minutes. With this command, Helen grabbed his wrist in an unbreakable hold, squeezing harder than she intended. Oh, well, she thought, ouch, mother, please. My wrist is not a walnut for you to crack. She released his arm so he could go inside. Just go see about your cousin. Whatever you're doing can wait. Make sure to wash up. Remember, with your father away, you are the head of the household. Hm. Obviously, Frank thought, even though the young man was accomplished and skilled, he sometimes felt his mother merely humored his scientific endeavors, much like a parent tacks a child's drawing to a mirror. It never occurred to him that his mother didn't care what he did. She loved him unconditionally. Besides, she was impressed, but didn't want to make a big deal about it. The difference was she could cry about it. He couldn't because he didn't understand it. Instead, he wanted to impress her. Well, he thought, it's not her fault she's not as smart as I am. My eyes have seen the glory. Helen's eyes followed him. Behind Frank, she saw a wall brimmed with family pictures. Helen beheld a perfect solipsism. The family was its own one true faith. They were special, and it wasn't her imagination. 
Her ancestors dragged themselves across the mist of time, marking their territory. True, there were hiccups. A distant Uncle Bob accidentally set a town on fire. But the grave robbing charges against Witchfinder William were dropped. Yes, making the future was a serious responsibility, a duty she tried to pass to Frank Jr. and his sister Inanna. Frank was interested in none of it, of course, passing the pictures without a glance. Believing in the family was all well and good, but it couldn't compete with Frank's belief in himself. Now he just wanted to get back to work. Down the hall and into the den he went. Inside, reading a newspaper was Charlie, all six foot four inches of him, wide as a cabinet. He had a slight Irish accent, which was strange because his family was German. He engulfed Frank. You're taller than a stink bug and just as skinny, Charlie said. It's good to see you. Okay, Frank thought. I just have to keep him from talking. Frank thought Charlie was at least smart enough to be impressed and would do whatever Frank told him to do. Charlie did, but only because it amused him, not because Frank thought it was due him. Charlie, dinner will be on the table in less than 30 minutes, and I know you need to freshen up, Frank said, hoping his cousin would disappear. Actually, I've already freshened. Want to smell? Lilac. Frank could not believe this was the same man whom he could not beat at chest. Thanks, no, come with me. Frank wasn't going to let Charlie distract him. He lost too much time today already. Same old Frank. So what are you working on this time? Hey, I just read an article about the fellow who invented the motor-operated pushover. He made his fortune on that one. Idiots, Frank said. Rather than let Charlie talk, he intended to fill the void with his own voice or risk boredom. The problem is that my so-called peers have no imagination. True, there are decent engineers, experts, but what good are they without an original idea? These so-called scientists just want to make better wheels. Just take the Goldberg Broaster, for example. 150 is too many moving parts just to cook bread. It takes an hour to assemble. To be sure, it makes wonderful toast and quite uniform. But how much toast can you eat? Well, this one time, said Charlie. And what about the Sapo mouse trap? The biggest invention was using peanut butter instead of cheese? I, on the other hand, proved mathematically that a mouse trap and a mouse can occupy the same space at the same time. But just because this physical effect will not occur under observation, they laughed me out of the room. Me, not one, had the wit to challenge my equations. They arrived. Frank unlocked the door, entered, and poured himself a glass of water. Make yourself at home, he said, and went off humming. Charlie looked around. The large workshop walls were covered with shelving and tools. Rafters loomed above. There were books and magazines, boxes, bottles and beakers, crates, a calendar. It was untidy, but not dirty. There were rows of gas lights overhead, hoist and winches. The floor was littered lightly with metal and wood shavings. A tin sign promoted the stupendous Marvello. By the door was a diploma from Dr. Beto's Pneumatic Institute, of which everyone knew Frank was its youngest graduate. A curtain blocked a quarter of the room. Charlie heard a lever close and hissing. Frank was behind the curtain, and Charlie could hear machinery and steam escaping. The rhythm of the hissing vaguely reminded Charlie of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Charlie, I just have one word for you. Simulos. Charlie just looked at him. That's a nice word. Indeed. What is it? It's yin, it's yang, the lever and fulcrum. This material will revolutionize the world and make my fortune. Throughout history, people have sought to create materials, skin, bone, rock, feathers, plants, Ancient man beat sand into lapis lazuli, and the Greeks made faux pelican eggs. The alchemists sought to change lead to gold. Today, 
Plant-based celluloid mimics ivory and bone, but it's too fragile. While we were traveling in Persia, I discovered a rare strain of hemp, which I cultivated. When distilled and mixed with proprietary processes, note mind the fumes, it produces simulose, stronger than steel and hardy enough to contain large amounts of energy. Isn't that just a better wheel? said Charlie. Frank ignored him. Imagine it. I can build steam boilers that weigh but a fraction. Trains no longer need to be iron giants nor depend on rails. I can build one weighing five tons or less. Do you know what a locomotive weighs? 762,000 pounds, 381,000 tons. A firebox is 22,500 square inches. Mine is less than a hundred. If that's true, then damn, Frank, that's scary. You want to know what I've been doing, Charlie? Voila! He ceremoniously opened the curtain. It's a carriage propelled by a steam engine. The cart was a square black cage, slightly larger than a prairie schooner. It was tall enough for men to stand. Instead of a jockey box in front, there was a padded branch behind which was a vertical hinged door that opened inward. In front of the bench was a panel with various dials and levers. The cage was decorated with mathematical and Greek symbols in gold. Charlie recognized a division sign, pi, an infinity loop, and others. There were long thin openings from front to back. Inside were benches, shelves, and cupboards. The tall thick wheels were covered with vulcanized rubber. It has a retractable waterproof bonnet I can put up if it rains, said Frank. More unusual was that in front was a large man, at least seven feet tall, with an enormous chest, seemingly made entirely of black metal, including his clothes. He wore a tight suit of an adventurer and a wide belt with a plain large square buckle. There was decorative gold stripes on the arms and legs and sides. The lapel was gold. The head hosted a Lincoln hat. Charlie could see various hinges and bolts and wire and coils. Steam valves in the shoulders, knees, elbows relieved tension through rising and falling flaps. The face was male and expressionless. Overall, the appearance was absolutely ridiculous. It looks like a bloke, said Charlie. Indeed, Frank proudly giggled. It's fabulous. His chest is the boiler. Underneath is a firebox surrounded by a water jacket. The top of his hat is exhaust. Various connections channel the energy to his legs. The hemp also provides an efficient fuel, which you can load through the back here. I'm having some shipped ahead. He's attached to the carriage in back here. Everything is colored to appear constructed of metal. Charlie looked closely at the head. Frank, is that your face? Of course. Who else would it be? It's kind of queer, though, isn't it? said Charlie. It's really hideous. I mean, you could have built anything, and you chose this. I mean... You could have just put the engine on the carriage to turn the wheels. Instead, you made this thing. Why would anybody think of this? What? You saw a rickshaw and thought, that's it. That's the future. Clockwork men pulling wagons? Charlie, Charlie, you know what a prototype is? Firstly, for now, I didn't want the engine in with passengers and supplies. That scares me. Secondly, in this case, Two wheels or legs are better than four. Would you rather a horse standing on its hind legs? Absurd. No, said Charlie, you're right. There's no way they'll laugh at this. Frank snorted. This will outrun any horse or team. The chassis and suspension practically are unbreakable. The brakes are built to last and it's defensible. There are hinged doors front, back, and top. There's a gun turret on the top and the carriage has slots for shooting. I just need a shootist. That's for sure. When people see this thing, you might as well have drawn a target on it.
Or is that what this sign is? Charlie said, pointing to a hydrogen atom symbol. Frank went to the sink to wash his hands. Father has been gone more than a year and three months with no word. Columbus found the new world faster. You're going to take that thing to California? Are you bugger? You get out in the middle of Job's backside, you are going to die. Probably painfully. They will dance on your corpse, if you're lucky, and steal your machine. That's why you're going to come with me. Oh, no. I wouldn't be caught dead in that thing, especially considering how much I'd get shot at. Frank turned to a desk, walked over, picked up a pistol, and fired. Charlie yelled, covered his ears, and ducked. Frank threw a second round at the engine. Both failed to penetrate. Are you crazy? yelled Charlie, although he admitted to himself it was impressive. That's fine, but what happens when they turn it over? Try. So Charlie, all 225 pounds of corn-fed goodness, tried to push over the steam man, but with no luck. The same thing happened with the carriage. Let me help, said Frank, as he pushed and pulled also to no avail. I thought this was a light plant. Both chassis are iron and steel mixed with simulose. I still don't like it, said Charlie. You'll meet lots of girls. Tempting, but no. Time was running out, but Frank had one more card to play. If you don't, Inanna will insist on going. Now that's just not fair, said Charlie, while his cousin eyed him like a biscuit he was about to eat. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. If you're so worried about her safety, you don't have to go, at least not this way. You know I have to. I will. Okay, I'll go, but under protest and you owe me. My mom's gonna kill me. Remember the time I sneaked away to that nature colony? I thought your mom could get mad. Speaking of which, have you told yours? I will at dinner. I don't think she would mind much. Besides, I'm seeing cracks in her armor. Maybe, and maybe she'll be madder than a waylaid honey badger. Why do you talk like that, Charlie? You live in the city. Frank whipped around to the speaker at his door. There was an Anna, two years younger and already taller than him. She hated her name, thought it sounded old-fashioned and Middle Eastern, although it was not biblical. According to Henry, every generation of her family known had a female named Inanna. Nobody knew what it meant. She called her grandmother Nana, so maybe that meant something. She had straight, long brown hair, freckles, a small nose, and gigantic feet. Mother says you two are to come along for supper. Well, Charlie... You ready to get back to Wisconsin yet? Uh, um, that is, gosh, I'm hungry. And Charlie loped out the door. The siblings followed him. You told him, didn't you? You told him you were going with or without him. I know that look. That's why I always beat him at cards. Answer me. What of it? You told him if he didn't go, I would. That's pretty low, even for you. I can take care of myself. Charlie, he's just a big kid, and you have no social skills at all. You will get hurt out there. This is a bad idea. At the table, Helen and the three youngsters enjoyed curried lamb, wild rice, grilled mushrooms, rapini, and soda bread with crab apple pie and watermelon. Helen made extra for Charlie, who ate twice as much as Frank. The boy genius excused himself twice for relief and once to clear his sinuses after a long sneezing fit. His mother drank red wine which he made in the cellar. The grapes from California were remarkably good for wine. Italian grapes like the Gracchicelli were especially sought after. Mother, I've taken my experiment as far as I can. I need to move to the next phase. Since we have not heard from Father, I plan to leave tomorrow to retrieve him, and I've asked Charlie to go with me. Sip. Silence. I see. Don't try to talk me out of it. Two sips. Pause. Are you insane? No. If you want to go to California, buy a train ticket like normal people. If you go out in that thing, I will lose you and you will stop writing and I can't see you. And why are you doing this to me? She slammed her hands down on the table. She ran out.
The dishes were cleared quietly. Frank's bladder was drained one last time and the lights were turned out. Three hours later, Frank and Charlie loaded up the carriage. There was an issue regarding Charlie's guitar, but he agreed to keep it in its case for now. They were almost done when Frank spied movement in the kitchen across the field. I'll be right back. Make sure my sister doesn't sneak in here. Frank went out and Charlie heard another his, which was odd because the engine was off. He heard it again and turned to find Inanna walking toward him from the back of the workshop. I don't want Frank to know I was here. Don't worry. I'm staying with mother. I just want you to remember that Frank is a selfish idiot, but he's no coward. I won't say you can count on him, but he won't run from a fight. He's not a great fighter, but he did beat up that dwarf once. Promise you won't let anything happen to him or you. Here, this is for you. What is it? Open it up after you've gone on a while, she said, looking towards the house. In the kitchen, in robe and slippers, Helen was bagging some fresh fruit and nuts, which she handed to Frank. Don't look at me like that. I can't stop you. But please don't be stupid. Be patient with everyone you meet on the road and try not to insult anyone. Stay away from girls. They'll eat you alive. And remember, just because you are right, it doesn't mean you're right. Buddhism, mother? Who knows? You may meet him on the road. And when you see your father, tell him he needs to be in excellent health as I plan to thrash him about the head. She bear hugged him for a while, kissed the top of his head, said, I love you, and went back to bed. And if Frank had taken his head from his posterior for only that one moment, he actually would have felt something. So, without fan fail except for the rising sun behind them, the steam man chugging away, gray mist escaping his hat stack, the journey began. Scarcely 15 minutes away from the homestead, the gregarious Charlie began talking. Frank wondered if he had made a fatal mistake. If he concentrated hard enough, he hoped he could make Charlie's head explode. Did you say something, Frank? No, I was clearing my throat. Please do go on. Well, anyways, that's what I told her. When I drop a hammer, I expect it to fall. And that's when she slapped me in my face. I swear, Frank, I can't figure these girls out. Problem is, they can't figure themselves out. They don't want what they want, and they want what they don't want, and the smart ones are dumb than the dumb ones, and the dumb ones are smarter than the smart ones. Yes, Charlie, it's a conundrum. What's conundrum mean, Frank? It means I hate you.